G'day, welcome to another edition of Backstage. We're going to be talking hoops with one of Australia's greatest ever basketballers. This guy's a bit of a maverick and a, a pioneer. He was the first Aussie drafted to the NBA from the NBL. Uh, he played in a pretty iconic era in the NBA in the late 90s. Uh, he's won MVPs, he's played in Russia. But one of the biggest highlights, I reckon, is if you're watching this Netflix Last Dance documentary series, he features in it. Might only be for a couple of seconds. Go to episode three, about two minutes in. Look for the skinny, seven-foot white guy cutting Dennis Rodman with a filthy elbow. It is iconic bit of footage. I'm talking about Chris Anstey, who joins us now. Anstey, what were your thoughts, mate, when you saw yourself in, in the last I'll dance? You, I'll tell you what, you, you, you get a bit of an idea of how your career has gone when your highlight is a two-second clip in a, uh, in a documentary. But, uh, it, look, it's been fun. It's, it's been fun watching it. It was, a, like you say, it was a great era of basketball. And this time in isolation has been really good to go back and revisit other moments as well, I suppose, and reconnect with some people. There uh, there have been some positives to come out of it. Now, as I said at the top, you were the first guy to be drafted to the NBA, an Aussie from the NBL. Uh, what was that experience like when, when you told, mate, suit up, you're going to be playing in the NBA at – an era where, I mean, everyone growing up, we just basketball cards were it. Uh, we were obsessed. And Saturdays, you know, you'd have NBA action on TV. Um, must have been pretty surreal experience in the, in the beginning. Yeah, it was. It was just the process of getting drafted was crazy because I didn't grow up with it like most basketball people. I played tennis. And it, it came about really, really quickly. So from playing tennis to starting the sport to getting an agent, and then to knowing that there were NBA scouts at most practices and games that I played in was it, it was surreal. And then to actually get drafted here in Melbourne, I didn't go to the draft because it was the middle of the NBL season. But now, look, it was one of those weird situations where probably the, the initial feeling I had was a little bit of guilt because my, I love my teammates so much and the program they'd been in. And I knew that any one of those guys would have love to have been where I'd been and I'd, because I'd been in it for a shorter amount of time, I kind of felt like I'd leapfrogged them a little bit. Um, so there was a sense of guilt, but just going to the NBA was, you know, landing over there, it became real. And I went from being someone who was doing pretty well in the NBL to someone who was, again, one of the rawest, worst players over there and had to restart and I guess reset where I needed to go. And it was, it was tricky. Um, did people instantly change around you when they knew that you were drafted to, to the NBA? Like you were saying before, you felt a bit guilty. Were, could you sense there was a bit of an envy among some of your teammates and so forth? No, no teammates were great. It was more the media and the fans. And I think even when I was playing the NBL games in the under-23 Worlds, which were later on that year, it, every time they wrote my name, it also sort of said Dallas Maverick or NBA draft pick in it probably did just add an extra level of pressure, which at that age you're probably not as well equipped to deal with as what I would have been now or what, what grown adults are. Um, but, look, it, it, it was probably other people's perception more than my own. For me, I had a season to finish. I, I didn't get to Dallas until after we'd lost in the grand final series to the Tigers, but... Yeah, you know, the, the night we lost, my bags were packed and I was on a plane the next morning, so it happened pretty quickly when the season was done. So obviously uh, this Last Dance documentary series is, is primarily around that season that you were drafted. Um, what was the perception then of the Chicago Bulls and, and the thought process of, holy shit, I'm, I'm going to be playing against <laughs> arguably the best ever sporting team ever? Well, and it was going to be the only opportunity. That was the thing. Yeah. Um, we travelled to Chicago earlier on in the season in December, so only a couple of seasons into my rookie year, and I wasn't getting minutes. I didn't hit the court and probably absorbed just sitting there and watching Michael Jordan and that crew really close up and thinking how cool it was. And by the time they turned up and, and played us in Dallas in March, I was 32 minutes a game over the last week and a bit and expected to play. But I think if you asked around the league, the feeling was – across the league that this was the last time because as this documentary made really clear, the Bulls knew it was the last time. They advertised that clearly and this was it. So 
when they got to Dallas, I knew this was going to be the only time I ever had a chance to play on the same basketball court as Michael Jordan, and that was going to be incredibly special. Um, it was something that family and friends flew around the world to watch and be a part of. And it was something that halfway through the game, when I hadn't played a second, I was as grumpy as I've been and probably as selfish in my internal thoughts as I had been because I just wanted to play against him and I thought we were going to lose. And the second half was was completely different. I, I got into the game early uh, in the third quarter, uh, did okay, but Michael Finley played great. Hubert Davis did some things and Cedric Sabalos ended up hitting a game-tying three-point basket to send the game to overtime, and we won. Um, I, I got to play overtime. I got in that tangle with Rodman that they had a bit of a clip of in the last dance, and it became this incredible learning experience, incredible memory, sort of a whole bunch of lessons wrapped into one four-hour block and uh, probably dovetailed into the fact that you know, the night before, a couple of nights before, I'd organised with Luke Longley to, to go out in Dallas and my mates came, a couple of my teammates came and uh, he brought along, you know, a, a bunch of the Chicago Bulls um, to come and drink with us at our own little private room. We went to a, a little bar in Dallas called Cedar Street and we enjoyed the night, which if you ask any of my friends, they probably can't tell you that we won, that they can tell you about drinking with Steve Kerr and Tony Kukoc and... Uh, wow. Luke Longley. So uh, it was a fun night. Um, this is pre-social media. Um, I've been reading some of your stuff on Facebook. It's been fantastic. And you wrote a really good piece about this game. Um, you, you mentioned in it that um, you wanted to get a photo with MJ and probably the only chance to do it was to, to hard you. fail him. Not not my finest thought, but at half time, it's this is before what we're doing now. We had no social media. The internet was brand new. And the NBA wasn't covered as widely in Australia as what it is now. No NBA league pass. Like you said, we probably got an hour's highlight every weekend. So I thought, you know, my mates back in the day weren't all basketball friends. I didn't think they'd believe me that I'd actually played against Michael Jordan and I needed a photo and couldn't, for the life of me, walk up to Michael Jordan in the middle of a game, put my arm around his shoulder and ask him to look across at the cameras and, you know, if you wouldn't mind, Mike, a photo. So it occurred to me the best way to do this if I got some garbage minutes, because it didn't look like I was going to play, uh, would be to over help off whoever I was guarding as he got to the rim and fouling hard enough that he was going to have to respond. Um, surely someone would take a photo of that. And that would have been my photo with Michael Jordan. But um, turns out I didn't get that photo. I got a couple with Rodman. But um, probably got something a little bit better. We, we got a win. We got all these lessons. And, you know, he's not calling me for a rematch. So I, I, I think that I'll uh, I'll end up 1-0 against Michael Jordan. Not that I had that much to do it. Not that he had his best game. But um, I guess not many people can, can say that. One thing I can't believe, um, we're only four episodes into this um, doco series, is why Jerry Krauts wanted to bust up this um, dynasty like, was it? Was, do you think it's purely ego and they were trying to build up this whole rivalry with um, Phil Jackson and all these players are getting more notoriety? Um, it doesn't make sense why you do that, does it? Yeah, it shows you the brutality of the NBA and that it is a big business. And one of the quotes Michael Jordan had, I think after they won their fifth championship when they were aware of it, was that they earned the right to defend what they'd won and... I tend to agree. I don't think you need to blow it up. You can make small changes and you can bring in a little bit more youth. But um, I think there was still a lot of, or not a lot, but some good years left in all of the players. And, you know, it, it seemed to me, and far be it for me to be an expert in it, but, you know, Pippen's younger than Jordan and he could have taken the number one mantle over the next couple of years. And imagine Michael Jordan in a Bulls uniform being a, the third string guy and being a mentor in his twilight years to a draft pick or a you know a free agent that had come across a young free agent and helping mold them. So yeah, look the the story could have definitely been different, but uh, from where it sat, I was it turned out ironically I was a part of the Bulls group that uh, played the year after they all left, and I don't think anyone could have imagined how 
much of a rebuild it was going to be, and most would argue that they're still rebuilding. Uh, mm -hmm. We're 20 years down the track and they still haven't got it right. And I just tend to think when you have got something incredibly rare and something that's generational, ride it as long as you can. Um, mm. that would create some history and I think even, even though we were really bad that next year, I think if they had a role with it longer, they, they would have bought even more goodwill from the sports fans of Chicago and more patience in the rebuild by rewarding the majority of that group. Did you have much dealings with Jerry Krauts when you went across to the Bulls? No, I was too naive. The only I, I just turned up, trained, played my games and, and sort of kept my nose clean. But um, probably the most I had to do with him was pre-draft. Um, he was the guy that spoke on behalf of the Bulls. He was the guy that travelled to Australia to see me play. And he was the guy that uh, I had conversations with and Brian Gorgian had conversations with. So my dealings were in that space and – I suppose that was one of the nice things when they did trade for me, although they didn't give up much, but I sort of knew that they'd wanted me a couple of years before they were interested. So that was a nice feeling. It uh, sort of took this thing out of being traded a little bit. What was the atmosphere like when you arrived in Chicago? Was um, There would have still been a lot of staff that were sort of a part yeah. of that, that dynasty era. Yeah, the the day-to-day -day was... It was different. I mean, you could tell they were taking a breath and they were rebuilding as well. And you still got the old stories and you got rumours about Carmen Electra and you got all those type of stories about the, the lucky equipment manager who had to go and wake Dennis Rodman up every morning and get him out of bed and kind of he'd cross his fingers that Carmen Electra greeted him at the door and not Dennis. So there are all those kinds of stories that filtered through. But um with regard to the fans, I think they knew how fortunate they'd been and certainly they held no ill will against the playing group, uh, maybe more against the front office. But again, I was so young and new to it back then, I probably didn't realise it as much as what I do now. But uh, with regard to atmosphere, it was probably different, I, I suppose. I mean, five months before I walked in the door, it was the, the biggest ticket in the sporting world and it went from being that to celebrating a pre-season win almost because we'd rebuilt so dr uh, dramatically. So uh, different, uh, unique would have been how I'd probably describe it. Um, another another takeaway from this series is just the mindset of these superstars. Like Jordan obviously is one of the most competitive guys going around. You you got to play with some superstars at, at Dallas. Um, you also wrote something pretty interesting on your, on your Facebook about Steve Nash and just his work ethic. Um, what are your takeaways from the experiences you had with guys like that? Just that, that Steve and, and Dirk Nowitzki taught me and, and Gorgian instilled a work ethic in me that I didn't think existed. And I was really proud of how hard I worked and what I was able to do, but they took it to another level. And as hard as I would work, they would work that hard, but then they'd go longer. And, you know, just I was really interested even in the Jordan documentary that Scotty Pippen said that, Michael Jordan taught him how to stick around a, a gym for longer and find other things to do when he thought he was done. And that was Nash and that was Dirk. That the amount of hours they put into their craft was incredible. You know, on, on top of the training and the lifting and the fitness, it was two, three hours every single day. So I, I took that away from them. And, you know, what I said about Steve was that, um, uh, you know, he wasn't, built like Michael Jordan. He wasn't that type of athlete. He wasn't blessed with that talent, but he worked and you didn't have to think back that long. And when I was when I played my year with Steve, when he first came across, our home fans were booing him. Uh, he was struggling so much. They were brutal. Um, they didn't like the trade. They thought that Steve sucked, uh, never dropped his head, never stopped working and became a two-time MVP. And if you look at the guy who was runners-up, um, He's out voting Kobe Bryant and some mm. legends of the game. That's how well Steve was going at the time from someone who was getting booed in his sophomore year in the NBA to a two-time MVP is just incredible. And probably the, the best thing I'll say about Steve would be that he's so normal that if you didn't follow basketball, he'd walk into a bar and have three beers with you without you even knowing uh, that he was a legend of the sport and that he was even any good at anything because he'd be interested in you. And I think that is a credit to the type of person he was. Um, just an incredible teammate. 
when when you were playing, there wasn't a lot of Aussies in the NBA. Did you have like a community outside of that where you could ring up guys like Longley and have a chat and, and get advice from? One of the things I'll be most grateful for was that Luke Longley reached out to me uh, a couple of days after I landed in Dallas. Just if I ever needed anything to look him up, uh, to make sure before we came to Chicago that he called me, he had me over the house for dinner. Um but, you know, took the time to explain the NBA and the business of it and what to expect, and we stayed in touch. And I'd never spoken a word to Luke before I got there, but, you know, just always remember him to take that time and reach out was incredible. Um, and to follow up with not only me, but no doubt the rest of the Australian NBA contingent that came across was was fantastic and just made the transition easier and a little bit more normal and, Hopefully, in some way, we gave him a bit of uh, variation from that Bulls dynasty and just a, a raw Aussie coming across and, you know, Shane Hill came and Andrew Gaze came and maybe just have another Aussie to speak to and talk about home. You never know. It might have just uh, been a break from his reality a little bit that he might have enjoyed too. Well, Gaze, he was bloody lucky. Like, he, he's got a NBA ring for his time at the... Uh the Spurs, yeah? He did. He walked into a good group. I think, for me, Tim Duncan was the number one draft pick in the year I got drafted, and he and Dave Robinson were the two in tandem most intimidating frontline I ever saw. They were so long and athletic and smart. It just felt... They're the reason that someone like me learns to shoot or has to learn to shoot because unless you're elite in the block, you're just not going to find a way to score on them consistently, they're that good. Um, so you've got to find a way to at least be able to generate a more uncontested shot wherever that is. So they're part of the reason that I probably spent so much time practising shooting the basketball because my NBA career would have been even shorter than what it was if I just lived in the block. I was going to say, what was the, the main differences in, in the style when you came to the NBA from playing at the NBL um, and, and what was it like playing on the likes of, you know, Patrick Ewing, Elijah Wan, Shaquille yeah. O'Neal, some of these absolute hitters of the game? The uh, speed, size and athleticism was the biggest difference. And even when I coach now, when when kids, every kid wants to learn how to dribble and learn how to perfect these different skills and every coach wants kids to be on the court all the time. But speed, strength and athleticism, and we don't invest enough time into that. And that's, who the NBA drafts and, you know, I mentioned Steve Nash and by, he's a great athlete, but by comparison, he was slow and not many people in the world work as hard as him. That's what it takes. Um, so young players need to invest in that. But uh, going against Hakeem and Shaq was the most physically dominant player I ever played against and he in his prime when he was still athletic was just... He still had that that strength, but such quickness off the ground and dunked everything within five feet of the rim. It was just incredible. And then when you got him and Kobe together, it was you, you pinch yourself sometimes. It was near on impossible. You see also, I saw some old interviews with Kobe talking about um, Shaq and these superstars that, that just mad trainers, they get frustrated yeah. that other teammates don't train as hard. Um, I could sense that Kobe was pissed off that Shaq didn't train to the level that he should have and because he was so big, he could still dominate. Do you find that that happens a lot in sport, that these superstars get shitty, that their teammates won't rise to that next level in terms of training yeah. and prep? Yeah, it can. You know, having said that, that doesn't work for everyone. And we're learning that if you had have asked Dennis Rodman to train like Michael Jordan did, they wouldn't have got nearly the same positive results as what they did. And I think it's about any athlete experimenting at some level, finding out what your limits are and what you're capable of physically doing and finding out what works best for you because, you know, I'll always say that I'd rather an athlete 80% prepared but 100% mentally committed or engaged than someone 100% physically committed but not really mentally engaged. So there's a balance. Um but no, I definitely see the frustration. And that's why a coach like Phil Jackson is so great because he helps guys like Michael Jordan understand guys like Dennis Rodman and 
understand that everyone's different. So, yeah, there's a frustration, but I think we're becoming better at recognising difference now. Now, just one more thing on Jordan. Um, you got to witness one of the most famous games of one-on-one ever. <laughs> Corey Benjamin. <laughs> Corey Benjamin. Do you want to tell yeah. us a story with that? Yeah. Um, Corey Benjamin was a, a second-round draft pick uh, in 2000, 2001 and had his rookie uh, – sorry, 99, 2000 and had his rookie year at the year I was with the Bulls and really good athlete and – Bill Cartwright, famous, not famously, not many people know about it, but Corey Benjamin took off to dunk on someone in a game and lost control, lost balance, the ball you know, fell out of his hands and he sort of went into the pho- you know, photographers and Bill Cartwright's looked down the bench and was like, this guy right here out jumps his ability to land. Um, he, he was that good an athlete, but, um, you know, he also had a bit of a inflated opinion of himself, probably fair to say, and... He'd been running his mouth that he'd probably be able to beat Jordan one-on-one and Jordan was now retired and that kind of thing. And word got back to Jordan from Randy Brown and, you know, Tony Kukoc and Dickie Simpkins and these guys that had been around. And Jordan turned up to practice at the end of practice one day and, you know, sweatpants, runners and a cut-off T-shirt and just found him and said, heard you've been running your mouth, let's go. And the guys who'd been around knew what was coming. And I was like, what's happening? And they just jumped on a side ring and he said, one-on-one game to game to seven. Uh, I think it was seven. And, you know, Corey Benjamin all of a sudden got real nervous and so it's okay, let's shoot for it. He says, look around, son. You know, those championship banners, they're mine. It's my ball. And so he proceeded to just dismantle Corey Benjamin one-on-one leaning on him in the block from the elbow. It, it didn't go very long and, you know, everyone's heard it now, but the you reach, I teach, you know, Corey Benjamin swiping at the ball and Jordan would spin on him and just every shot that Jordan found for himself was uncontested. He just had such great craft as to how to use his body and how to use his strength and, you know, the, the second it was done, I was like, don't call me out of retirement again for that bullshit. You know, it was... And it just walked off and went and talked to his, you know, the guys he'd played with. So for me, it was, yeah, just I'm, I'm glad someone filmed it because I was, you kind of see my head just, if you had seen my face, it was just watching Jordan play one-on-one sitting on an exercise bike and it was, it was a lot of fun. But everyone else there had seen it all before. But it, it gave you, or gave me, another little glimpse into just how good he was. And I suppose it's not often you, you're at an NBA practice session and, the guy who doesn't play in the league anymore turns up to be the best player there, but that's how good he was. Uh, looking about your time in the NBA, Chris, is there anything that you do differently now with a bit of hindsight? Yeah, probably the one thing would be I would have brought someone over with me, um, someone that I trusted, a, a coach. or you know, I think you've got to be able to spend a lot of time working on specific areas in your game that you don't quite get with an NBA coaching staff because they do have their job to do and – Dirk always had that, and I learned that from him. And in my third year, I ended up bringing over John Dord the year after he retired. And that was really beneficial, but probably might have done something like that earlier to, you know, the days I couldn't, quite, wasn't quite as motivated to do that extra work to drive me, but also to probably spend time just almost selfishly improving me away from the group um, probably would be my advice. You'd, you'd know, you know, Ben Simmons would have someone. I know Paddy Mills has probably got someone and, you know, find that person to, to bring over earlier. I was going to say that that obviously is common practice now, given particularly how much salaries are increased. Um, do you think in the post-corona environment, uh, they're talking about cutbacks, you know, locally with AFL and things like this. Will this have a wide range effect on salaries and so forth and extra spending in the NBA as well? I'm sure it probably will. There's people smarter than me to know that, but it's always going to end up being a percentage of revenue, isn't it? Um, So I don't know how long it takes for the NBA or the AFL to start generating the same revenue that they were before. And um, With the NBA, and I was a part of a lockout, the argument was always over the players wanted more than 50% of revenue because, you know, they considered at the time, and I didn't agree with them, that they were the product. And I agree with that part, but... We had no financial risk. Uh, it was the owners who could actually lose money. They'd invested millions and mil- hundreds of millions of dollars and they could lose 
that uh, you know as athletes we don't lose money we just get paid less so there's not nearly the same level of risk so i'm sure salaries will drop uh in the short term but i think that's going to be across the board in in business globally that you know sports not exempt from that and I, i think athletes at some level have to be a little bit unselfish as well and understand that's reality now and uh, they do have to take a bit of a hit short term and it'll catch up eventually. Now, after the NBA, you returned to the NBA. You played with the Titans for a couple of years. Um, but I'm more interested in, in when you decided to go to Russia. Um, sure. how, did, how did all that come about? And you've got some pretty um, unbelievable stories. Yeah, uh, the, the, the Titans folded um, and I was in Europe and, and Gorgian, who was the coach of the Titans, was actually the coach and Jason Smith was there as well and he was a teammate of mine and we found out together in a hotel in Europe and we both had pretty good tournaments and it actually jumps to mind. John really was a teammate at the time and he had a fantastic tournament as well and we were able to pick up European jobs. So really and I didn't. Jason ended up in Italy at one stage as well. Um, but I did have offers from Greece and, uh, and Italy and Croatia and, um, and then this one from Russia came and we, we'd played against a, a Russian team and I'd spoken very briefly and very limited to some of the players who had a, who knew a word or two of English and their offer was more than anyone else. And when I went home and thought about it, the challenge of doing something that no one else had done, um, play professional basketball in Russia that no Australian had done became... Intriguing. I mean, I got there and thought I might, I'd stuffed up straight away. It was, it was the hardest year I ever had. Um, you know, Were you thinking 40, pretty pretty early on there's uh, no one that's done this for a reason? Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, minus the difference between minus 45 and zero is the same as plus 45 and zero. It was incredible and really lonely. That You know, no one spoke English. Um, I had a one-year-old daughter who came for a little bit and uh, – you know, went home at Christmas time. Then the SARS virus hit, so I had six years, uh, six months by myself. Um, just really tough and lonely. But it ca- kind of went through a really hard month, sort of January, February, and figured I better, you know, stop feeling sorry for myself and get out of this. And did a pretty good job of that. Had some good results on the basketball court. Uh, we came runners up in the Russian Super League. Um, I won MVP of the European League. We're playing in and. Ended up signing for another two years in a slightly better basketball environment in Russia again. But, you know, my basketball currency was highest in Russia or higher in Russia than anywhere else in Europe. And, uh, yeah, learnt a lot in those three years. My, my two eldest children had their formative years there. And if anything, you know, was a, a little bit like we are now. We spent a lot of time indoors with them. We spoke to them a lot. We, we played. We were engaged in their development and, you know, probably there were, there were two main reasons I ended up coming back after three years. Um, one of them was that my under-20s Melbourne Tigers coach had just gotten the uh, NBL Melbourne Tigers coaching gig in Al Westover and I, I really wanted to play for him again. And the second one was in the off-season, we'd kept my daughter enrolled in kindergarten and arrived back home in Melbourne after my third year and that, you know, put her in a kindergarten for the two weeks leading into holidays and the difference in Izzy after just 10 days of being around other kids who spoke English for hours every day was was so positively noticeable that I just couldn't take her out of that again and bring her to Russia. So I was the easiest guy in the world to negotiate for the Melbourne Tigers. I suppose um, one of the biggest fears for Aussies, or most common one, is when you're in a place where you can't speak the language, um, is if there's a medical emergency, you know, how do you communicate to doctors or whatever. Um, You weren't lucky enough to go through without anything going wrong. Uh, Tell us a story about when when you had issues. Yeah, it was – I had the one rule I had was if I get sick, I'm leaving because if you had have seen the – medical facilities, even the hospitals in, and it was Kazan at the time, um, they made MASH look like the Prince Alfred. They were just horrendous. Um, but I got, you know, all the symptoms turned out I had appendicitis and I was lucky I had Martin Mercep who had came to this team with me as well and was on the phone to him and luckily I had a translator but 
the doctor told me through Martin that I needed to have my appendix out now. It was about to burst and I told him London. Uh, he says, you can't fly. And I'll never forget Martin's words where he seems like he's done this before. He said it should be okay. <laughs> and that, that was all the comfort I had. And so they rolled me into a room of 30, 40 wooden tables full of people on them and um, freezing conditions and uh, just took all my clothes off and started shaving me butt naked and rolled me down the hallway still butt naked into the surgery. And, you know, honestly, those green plastic bins with the black lids were just full of bloody bandages. There was another wooden table with like a dolphin torch hanging from the roof and this was surgery. I thought, I'm going to die. Martin wasn't allowed in by this stage and, you know, the, 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 the nurse or I guess the anaesthetist by now was asking me how much I weighed, I think, and I, I, I knew a little bit, so I told her, I thought I told her 113 kilos, and she strapped my arms down to these other two tables and had started putting, uh, you know, the, the, the drugs in to knock me out. Um, and as soon as I, you know, then started, you know, the alcoholic swab and I'd close my eyes and, you know, alcohol when you've just been dry shaved stings like crazy and I was tied down and just oh it hurt, hurt like crazy um, so anyway I, I closed my eyes and the next thing I know you know that noise when you go to the the cutlery drawer and rattle it around I heard that and I thought geez what's that so I was still awake so I opened my eyes and the surgeon was ready to start and I guess he just thought that when he closes his eyes you start operating and I started yelling at him and he, you know, that he had on the mask and the, the hat and he just saw these two big eyes and um, started yelling at the nurse and she put drugs in my other wrist and, you know, they were just having this argument when I fell asleep. I was trying so hard to keep my eyes open. I thought I was going to die. Um, turns out I didn't, but um, very, very grateful to wake up. Um, but was in hospital for, you know, no antibiotic tablets back then. I needed injections and was in hospital over the weekend and trying to be tough. They said, look, do you need anyone in here with you? I said, no, nah, I'm good. Um, didn't realise I went home over the weekends, so there was no one in there. Um, I had this weekend to myself and I was in that much pain before Monday morning rolled around and nurse had turned up and nurse turned up. My wife at the time turned up and the place stunk and I said, what's that? And nurse was like, well, that's the people who've died over the weekend. I said, what? So this, this is what it was like over there. It was just another world. And, you know, if there's anything I take from Russia is that I've, I very, very rarely complain about anything anymore because we've got it so good here in Australia in so many areas. And I guess until you remove yourself from it, you don't quite appreciate it enough. But um, the medical was a different world. The, the communication, the, the climate, Russia was just this different world that I'm very, very grateful I went through, but it was tough, um, and I grew up a lot. I was going to say, like, it seems like up until this period, it's, it's very much of an up and down sort of roller coaster where, you know, the mental health side of things, I mean, you, you're trying to constantly deal with these high, extreme highs, extreme lows. What sort of toll is this starting to take on you? You come back um, to Australia, you know, you won a couple of championships uh, with the Tigers, 05, 06, and 07, 08. But you, you wrote on your um, your Facebook stories the other day about um, you got to a point where you, where you really wanted to reach out and talk to some other athletes. You're a passionate Western Bulldogs fan and um, you thought about reaching out to uh, then Jason Ackermanis about how you deal with pressures and so forth. How was yeah. uh, the mental health side of things, particularly um, to the latter part of your career? Look, everything's tough. Um, I've never had, I mean, I've, everyone, I think everyone goes through highs and lows and we always like to, of course, give something a name or a title. But, um, you know, I was as hard as things got, I was always okay. Um, but probably the thing, I mean, the thing that was hardest for me, if you take away my career, be, that, that becomes easy. But going through divorce, I think, was hard. And, um, you know, on the way to that, you know, after I'd won a couple of championships and probably motivation was the thing I was lacking a little bit right towards the end. I was looking for new ch challenges and had a lot going on. I had, you know, an ex-wife now who I was in a, a court or a legal battle with and 
I wasn't allowed to see my kids nearly as often and, you know, in a divorce, everybody has an opinion and everybody sort of tends to take sides a little bit and that's just everyone's opinion. And, um, you know, there's a lot going on outside basketball. That basketball was a an escape at some level, but at the same time, it, the other stuff, sort of life took its toll a little bit. But, um, yeah, it occurred to me that I, I didn't particularly want to be turning up to basketball training. I kind of wanted to feel sorry for myself a little bit and wasn't the best teammate for, for a period of time. And, um, yeah, I've always been a Western Bulldogs fan and um, tried to think of someone who always seemed to have something going on negatively away from their own sport um, that but always seemed to be able to perform well because I didn't think I was performing as well as I could have and it occurred to me that might be Jay Snakamana. So I called the Western Bulldogs Footy Club and left my number with the receptionist, sort of clearly not expecting much. Um, I was still on the drive home when Aka called me back and said, mate, do you want to get a coffee, get lunch over in Mooney Pond? So I just kept driving and sat down and talked to him for hours and he was incredible. Um, to this day, he's very, very, uh, yeah, people love him or they hate him. Um, he's divisive. Um, but for me, he gave his time. Um, he taught me a lot about, you know, the the importance of sports psychology, you know, the, the ability to control what you can control, um, make sure that whatever you do in your own time, you're doing the best you can for your team when you're around them. Um, and the ability just to only, and we'd always spoken about it, but, you know, the opinions of those who you really cared for the, were the ones that mattered. There'd always be people trying to knock you down. So, you know, we kept catching up whether, you know, every, we caught up probably 6, 10, 12 times over the next few months and those conversations were great. Um, it was fascinating for me that he was interested in my basketball journey as well and seemed to take an interest in that. But more so than anything, I just learned to pick up the phone and call others as well. Um, I call coaches, I call players, I've called CEOs and most of them don't get back to you, but all, all you've ended up doing is investing 30 seconds of your life to leave a message. But those who do turn, you know, return your call, uh, some of my really great learning experiences and lessons have come from those catch-ups or phone calls. I was going to say that would have given you a bit of confidence, the fact that Aka did get back to you and you have developed this friendship and got a lot out of it. Um, how, do you, how do you sort of break the ice though when, say, you're ringing a CEO um, what what are the first couple of things you sort of say to them when, when you haven't met this person um, before? I think just be genuine. Um, don't try to, to be smarter than what you are. Uh, tell them why you're calling. And I think, and, and look, it, I'm probably since I've retired and even when you do it, you, you realise you've done a few things okay when you know, people reach out to you, whether you've presented to them in a, a school class or coached them for a short period of time and, the really enjoyable part of coaching or teaching uh, when people that you do coach or teach reach out to you, not because they have to, but because they want to, and they're the really good conversation. So you, I guess you take a little bit, well, here's how I'd like to share what I know and help this person. And I think if they have said that it's okay to call them, they genuinely want to help. So, you know, a little bit for me it was, you know, introduce myself here's what I've observed of you from afar and I really respect that um, I'd love to get to know more about how you lead or um, how you build culture or whatever it is that's intrigued you about this one person um, from afar and see if that is up with uh, what it is that you have a conversation about and let the conversation go where it goes but be authentic in listening and don't try and I think there's a tendency for a lot of young coaches and teachers to do that, but just to be vulnerable and listen, um, ask questions that you might be uncomfortable asking, or you might think you can't ask that. Um, don't be the don't be the person that asks the same question that every single other person asks these people. Ask something that's relevant to you, not everyone else. Is there any other examples outside of ACA, say even in the corporate world, people that you've, you've, no one has ever really heard of that, that really stand out for you that, that's helped you on that journey? 
Hey, Gerson with Greg O'Neill. He's the CEO of Latrobe Financial. I met him uh, through his son uh, years and years ago. Um, a guy named Glenn Sharp was the general manager of um, Mercedes Melbourne, the Automotive Holding Group of Australia. Um, so, so many. Uh, John Burgess was, was another guy who runs a consulting group, but and, and I'm going to miss a bunch. Um, Dickie Custerson, who ran an events company, has passed away. I learned so much from. But, you know, even, you know, Rodney Eade gave time. Craig Bellamy gave me some time. Paul Ruse has been incredible. Um, did, you detect, did you detect patterns from these successful people, like what yeah, they were doing? Authenticity, um, empathy, um, understanding that, you know, the cliche, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care, uh, to take an active interest. I mean, you can, I don't, I'm not sure you can actually teach empathy. There are some people who do care about people that they're around and want the best for them, and there are others who want to climb a corporate ladder or climb a coaching ladder, and that becomes obvious soon enough. Um, you know, hopefully if I'm one thing when I'm a coach or when I'm around business <clears> people, I, I do want the best for people around me. Um, whether or not that always shows, um, that's part of my growth, but um, genu you know, genuinely wanting the best for those around me and, and around others. But it, there are certainly patterns and, you know, it's not for me to probably share everything that I learned from all of these people because that's me evolving my philosophy and I, at some level I'm allowed to be a little bit selfish because I'm still a work in progress, but certainly I'm very grateful for those people who've given me time. And not only that, I, I learned from people, you know, Dustin Fletcher was my old tennis mate and doubles partner that I, I've reconnected and spent more time with the last couple of years. And even the kids I coach and some of the, the younger adults that I coach is I'm learning from them without them even knowing. And they probably still don't know. But um, I think that's the thing. It's that those coaches that I speak to are always learning and always looking for a way to improve whether people around them know it or not. I was going to say, um, now that you are a, a coach uh, and you tr you're trying to be a mentor as well, what are, what are a couple of those sort of key lessons that you try and instill in, in the, the younger generation? Habit, um, improve your habit. Um, what are you doing when no one's watching? Um, it's really easy to impress people. I mean, people are smart. A, a teenager is smart. He or she knows exactly how to behave and what sort of effort to put forth or what to say when they know they're in front of somebody who can give them an opportunity. But um, who are they when they're not? When they don't think they're being evaluated? And I've seen countless examples of people who've blown opportunities when they didn't know they were being evaluated. Um, and then complain about not having an opportunity. But uh, no, it's habit and behaviour. Um, you can only bullshit people for so long. Um, you, you're gonna, your habits are going to catch up on you. And, you know, there are a few behavioural traits that don't lie that I think people who've been around the block, coaches and bosses, know exactly what they're looking for. And hopefully I'm getting towards that. Um, but... Uh, yeah, everyone provides something different. I don't think with regard to personality. I, I love blending personalities. I love unique people. I love exploring how people think and what makes them tick. And I think a good coach or a good leader really wants different players with different skill sets or different employees with different skill sets to learn how to make each other better even when they're not around. Um, chatting to... Uh friends in the cycling game, um, there's been a big shift in the mindset of uh, younger athletes coming into the professional ranks as opposed to 20 years ago where it was a real like, you know, you've got to do the hard yards and earn respect and there's different mindset. Do you find the younger generations coming through now are a little bit harder to work with in terms of they've got a bit more sense of an entitlement as opposed to when you when you first started out 20 years ago? Uh in general, yeah, they, they want results now and are prepared to put in the work without posting it on social media or without having the need to tell people. Um, you know, not many people achieve success under the bright lights of the stadium without doing the work away from the bright lights. But with the advent of social media, we, you know, we have this desire, we being um, general, you know, younger in particular, 
athletes that we need to prove that we're working um, and tell people what we're doing. Um, we need reassurance that we're doing the right thing, but um, sometimes it's just taking a chance and do more work without anyone knowing you've ever done it. And, you know, I think if there's a common thread, I know I used to think this and I thought it was a little bit different. I always used to want to go away and come back and people go, geez, what did he do? Like he looks different or he's, he's mm. better than what he was when I remember him. There was a, a sort of an excitement about that and um, that doesn't seem to exist as much anymore and they, they want to get to the destination more quickly, don't understand that they need to get worse oftentimes before they get better. Um, your daughter, Isabel, is signed with uh, UCLA. Um, how exciting is um, the future looking for her? And yeah. and uh, obviously you got some, some key tips to give her when she when finally goes over and cracks it in the US. Yeah, she's exactly what we've just been speaking about. Um, yeah. Very proud of where she is, but she needs to work a lot harder. Um, she needs to do more during isolation. She needs to do more without me or somebody else dragging her along to do it. Um, but she'll learn that. And, um, <laughs> How do those conversations yeah, go? Not out? great. Not great. Um, <laughs> but sometimes athletes have to figure it out for themselves and you need to take some hits and she'll take some hits. But, um, you know, I think oftentimes we're, product of our, we're products of our environments and I think the thing that excites me most about her opportunity is that she chose the right school for her. Um, UCLA, from what I can tell, is full of high achievers who have great work ethic and great habits and she's going to you know, immerse herself into that so she'll have no choice but to change her habits and behaviours in, in a positive way and I think it'll be another, you know, if she can do that and it's going to be really uncomfortable, uncomfortable for her then she's got tremendous upside because she's a really tough kid um, when she wants to be. Um, the challenge is being that all of the time. Yep. Um, before I let you go, mate, um, you still keep in touch with uh, a few of your old teammates back in the US. I know you still chat with um, Big Dirk and the likes. Um, yeah, really. How, we how they, and, yeah, great to see them. And I think the last thing anyone wants is to be hassled by some old teammate over in Australia. But, you know, teammates are great. And I think the longer you go, the maybe the more you realise you've got in common and the catch-ups become even better. And uh, yeah, you know, those guys you mentioned are always great with their time. We don't bother each other too much, but when we're in town, it was it was nice to turn up and have a few beers with Dirk and Izzy got to meet him and probably I you know get to see it through her eyes a little bit as well because she's idolised him since she's been very little and you know he sent her a signed jersey when she got injured one time and missed out on an Australian team because of the injury and that's something I've never forgotten and uh, that's something that certainly she never has uh, forgotten but. Uh, for her to meet him was incredible and for him to take the time just to talk to her for hours in his living room was, you know, something that I hope that she remembers and continually learns from what he told her because there were some rippers in there, um, mm. but they're for her, not others. Oh, uh, well, it's important to be humble, mate. And uh, on that, we really appreciate you coming on and having a chat. And, yeah, I'm sure the listeners or viewers would, would take a fair bit out of uh, you, your story Definitely, mate. Um, no, it's pre appreciate your interest and uh, look forward to doing it again and look forward to seeing who else you, uh, you drag on to have a chat with. Yeah, well, we'll try and get out uh, of the worm Robin on, get a get a response, eh? <laughs> you wouldn't even remember. Yeah, no, all good, mate. Uh, appreciate the time and You're more than we'll welcome. chat again soon. Cheers, Dan.